a plane. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 92. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Austin Smokowitz, one half of the Dr. Witz design team behind the really fascinating game Robotech Reconstruction. Austin, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Robotech Reconstruction, I got to play it digitally a couple of weeks ago at this point, and I found it super fascinating. It's almost like a lighter coin, slightly lighter coin style game. And I don't think enough people have heard of it or have even, even know of its existence. So I'm super excited to have you on Austin to discuss it. Uh, Cause I think it's, it is a design that more people need to uh, know about. But- Thank you. I, pre- I appreciate that. And yeah, I was, was going to say, since you did have a chance to play it a few weeks ago, uh, I am curious about, cause like with a game like this, it's always hard to really nail down the description for other you know for other people like exactly what this thing is and it's like and i'm always curious to hear from people who've played it and who have enjoyed it to basically say like how how would you describe robotech reconstruction you called it light coinish but imagine you're talking to people who have never played a coin game before like what what does that even mean yeah <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thought experiment i guess i would say it is i was talking to someone who wasn't familiar with board games at all. So if I had to cut out all jargon, I mm. think I would describe That's, that's it, even more difficult. I, I that's make, even more difficult. I make it hard on myself. I would say it is, it is a game where four people each control four different factions trying to get control of Earth in this fictional anime-inspired universe. I think I'd start there, right? The four different factions. I think that's the core of it. Is that how you would how you would describe it? Yeah, I mean, if I when I talk to people who are not gamers or who don't know coin, I always try to describe it as a it's a asymmetrical multi-layer area control game. And like even that to a complete non-gamer is complete nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because what you're doing in this game, right? You mentioned it right off the top. You got four asymmetrical factions, each with their own victory condition. So each player is looking at the board a little differently, but what they all share in common is that they need to control territories on the board in order to achieve their goals. And in fact, there's, there's, I call it dual layered because you have two factions that are just fighting for control of the territories, but then you have two other factions that are fighting for these, these, uh, these civilians that live within the territories. And they're trying to move these civilians around to make them happy or unhappy. And it's like, you know, but they still need to have control of the territory in order to do that. Mm-hmm. And so you have these two layers that's all hooked in by this concept of you still need to be able to control the territory. But the trick is that because everybody's looking at the map a little differently, sometimes you gaining control of a territory in order to like change these civilians' minds actually gives points for somebody else. And you can accidentally give somebody else the win just by you contro- controlling that territory for them. Yeah. So then you get into this idea of like it's four players. But each player has like a half ally because when they take control of a territory, they're also helping their half ally by having control of that territory. And you also have like a direct enemy because, you know, you're you're paralleling against each other. And then you have like this half enemy that like it sometimes it's nice to just take over their their stuff to stop them from winning. Or sometimes you need to take over one of their territories just so that you can gain access to the thing that they might not necessarily care about and now already i kind of feel like yeah might have walked down a little bit too much of the rabbit hole because now we got to put names to things and we got (laughs) to describe exactly what this thing is it's like okay now we got to take a step back yeah and say what what is robotech because then you also have to take a step back and say what what is robotech right yeah describe (laughs) me the setting because i had never heard when i played a couple weeks ago i had never heard of the anime I'm not really into anime. I, I've watched a couple, but it's it's like a huge franchise, right? 
That's right. It's uh, Robotech is a huge franchise that's been around since the early, it was first created in the early 80s, and it still has a large following today because it was very good. That's the thing. Like, that's the, I think that's the key thing to understand. It was a good show that came up with a lot of really cool ideas. It's humans versus aliens in space with giant mechs that fight each other and transform. And at the same time, you also have this long running plot going on. So you have characters that you invest in and care about. And every couple of episodes, things are dynamically changing. So it's not like a sitcom thing where everything is reset to the status quo at the same, at the end of same, at the end of each episode, it's actually fairly serialized. So you can like sit down and binge it and, you know, you get carried through it. And the thing about Robotech, the IP is that over here in the States, so there's this, you know, as always happens with translations and especially with the era, there's this whole thing where in Japan, it's called Super Defense Force Macross. Over here, what they did was they took Super Defense Force Macross and then they took another series and another series and they put that all together underneath the name Robotech owned, you know, underneath the IP holder of Harmony Gold. And for the longest time, there was this schism between the two. And we still see it today as we're going through it, where people are like, well, this looks fun and all, but they're using all the fake names from America, <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, yes, but, you know, these, these are the rights holders we are working with. So we're, you know, like, we're still kind of here. If you want to pretend it's got a different name, that's great. Um, but, <laughs> but like, you know, this is so, so there's that. And, and, and for the longest time, there had been a schism between these two properties, but only within the last year, there had been some heavy contract negotiations. I really don't know all of the details, but it's like, there's at least harmony now between the Japanese side and the American and, and the U S and the English side, and they're going to make a movie and they're, you know, this is, so, so like, like the production itself is a long story, but I think what's important for this game, Robotech Reconstruction, is that despite the length of time that this property has been around, the universe is fairly consistent, right? Like the way that the fandom treats this is almost like a historical and Instead of, you know, unlike some other properties that have been around for this long, you have like branching universes and you have, oh, we did some stuff and now we're going to ignore those things. And like you take the new Halloween movie that right, that's right. just come out, right? We're ignoring Halloween two, three, four, five, six. And we're just going to say, no, 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 it's Halloween one, Halloween 2018. And now this Halloween, we're going to dump everything. So like the Robotech property, that never happened to the Robotech property. It's always been like, here is the universe and people have been expanding on it. There's been a lot of extra stuff, but it's all been fed back into the same universal timeline and you haven't, haven't had huge parts jettisoned out of it. So that makes, so that makes putting a game together like this very fun because while on the one hand, when we're designing it, we have to stick to, you know, what is in the show exclusively in the show, we also are able to like play with, you know, like we know that there's other stuff going on that could be alluded to, but never actually in the game, but like it can still hold itself to be consistent. And we're still probably not getting to the nub of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what is Robotech reconstruction then? Okay. So that's Robotech. Sure. So that's that's Robotech. And the story of Robotech is we are it's the 80, you know, it's made in the 80s, but it's in the far future. And, uh, you know, like Robotech reconstruction takes place in the far future of 2013. And um, <laughs> and, you know, at this point, aliens like an alien ship crash lands on Earth, the humans come to it, form an international base around it. They try to reverse engineer it, figure out what's going on. 10 years later, by the time they finally get the thing up and operational, they're able to reverse engineer it and get it to work. The aliens show up to get their ship back that crashed on Earth and thus begins 
the the saga of Super Defense Force Macross, where you have this alien this alien ship that's been retrofitted into a human ship being chased down by a whole bunch of aliens called the Zentradi. And they the Zentradi start attacking Earth. So the ship warps out to Pluto. And then there's this long chase sequence as they come back to Earth, as the aliens are like trying to capture the ship, but the humans think they're trying to kill them. And the humans are like, we win, we win. And the aliens are just like, mm, they didn't fall for our trap this time. We'll get them next time. Right. <laughs> so there's this great little ace asymmetry going on. And Robotech Reconstruction is a nine episode arc at the very is a nine that is specifically nine episodes at the end of the super defense force back across the, the first season of Robotech. And at this point in time, there's already been the what's called the first Robotech war. And now because it's called the first Robotech war, you know, there's going to be more. But at this point in time. It's just the Robotech, you know, it's just the first it was, Robotech It was a very war. pessimistic naming system, right? <laughs> right. They're like, we're after call this one the first <laughs> Robotech War. <laughs> right. Because after World War One, they didn't call it World War I. They, right, called, yeah, it, yeah. they called it something else. Um, they called it the War to End All Wars. But a much more optimistic name yes. than that World War One was. Um but so after the, so we are, so at the end, so the, the setup for the game is that at the end of the first Robotech war, the Zentradi say, okay, forget it. We're not going to try to capture the ship anymore. Let's just destroy the earth. Let's just kill all the humans. That'll, that'll just make this a lot simpler for everybody. And they proceed to bombard the planet to, to dust and our heroes, the Robotech Defense Force, who you've been following this entire time, they fight back against the Zentradi and they win. They win with some help. Some of Zentradi actually defect and join the side of the humans and they technically win. Now, yes, 90% of the earth is destroyed, but because they tried to kill everybody and we killed a whole lot of them, we consider it a win, right? So. Here we are on a devastated planet. And yes, again, this is all in the, you know, this is all the anime. You got to remember you're, you're like 20, you're like 30 episodes in and now 90% of the earth is destroyed. And you're like, okay, you're like, okay, spoilers, everybody for a, <laughs> for a multi, for a couple decade old show. But like, so what happens is the humans, the Robotech defense force, they stop the alien invasion they crash their giant alien. They, they crash the ship, the SDF-1, the ship that the aliens were after this whole time. It still survives. It crashes back on Earth. And then we flash forward two years later. And this is where we are with the game. You have the Robotech Defense Force, who has been spending the last two years getting the planet up and running again. They've been the de facto people in charge to make sure that you know the earth didn't just completely die out. They've been rebuilding the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, getting the atmosphere up and running, making sure plants and whatnot can rebuild again because most of the planet's bombarded and this ship has the most advanced technology on the planet now and they're like using that to keep everything up and running. Now the thing, now the other factions in this game, because it's four factions in this game. And the thing to understand is that so you have the Robotech Defense Force, that's one of the players. Then you have their ally, the who we are calling the Robotech Expeditionary Force, and they are the Zentradi that defected during the war and are helping the humans out. So like they're they're the, they're co-allies in this. And when and so you have the Robotech uh, Expeditionary Force that are there and their their whole thing is that um, you know, they know that there's like more threats out there. There's more Zentradi that will come. There's these characters called the Robotech Masters. There's even further threats that we won't even get into here because they come in, they show up way later in the show. But like there's threats out there and they, the, our, the Robotech Expeditionary Force, the aliens, the, the Zentradi aliens of that group, they know that the only way to keep Earth protected and safe is to uh, keep the Earth united and together so that they can face these other extraplanetary threats. 
So when you play as them in the game, your goal is just to take over a whole bunch of territory and hold it for the REF. I mean, for, for the RDF, for the Robotech Defense Force, and like in their name. But here's the thing. Not all of the Zentradi that they had been, not all the aliens that they had been fighting died in the fight. In fact, because again, a lot of them rebelled, a lot of them defected, and a lot of them crashed back to the planet and survived. So you have all of these pockets of civilizations that are like human and Zentradi mixed regions. And as you come to find out during this portion that humans and Zentradi actually share, actually are a lot more similar than they may first seem. So you could potentially accidentally mistake a human for a Zentradi and vice versa. So you have these civilian populations made up of humans and Zentradi. The only thing is that the Zentradi being an alien race, they've been born and bred for nothing but war. They know not like that is that was has been their culture. So this concept of civilian life is very new to them, very and very difficult for them in order to it's a very difficult adjustment period. So when you play in the game as the Robotech Defense Force, as the RDF, as the heroes of the show, your main goal is to keep these Zentradi civilians that are around the map happy because the last thing you want them to do is to rebel, which brings us to our third faction, the Zentradi Rebellion. <laughs> the, so the third faction in the game is the Zentradi Rebellion, led by a charismatic individual called Commander Chiron, who you have been, you know, if you were watching the show, he's been a presence throughout the show. Over the entire course of the show, every time the his commanders have said, we're trying to capture this ship, Commander Chiron has been going, I just want to blow it up. Can we just blow it up? Let's just go blow it up. We can we can just get rid of this problem now. Let's just do this. And he survives the war and he crash he crash lands on earth and he just decides to hide out. He's like this isn't like I can't win right now. I'm going to hide out. But he has spies out and his spies it's now 2 years later and his spies are telling him that the that there has been a uh, discontent amongst the Zentradi civilians. And so Chiron is like, okay, it's time to come back. It's time to lead my people. It's time to finish the job that we started two years ago. So when you play as Chiron and the Zentradi Rebellion, your whole goal is to run around the map using Chiron to uh, convert these uh, citizens, these Zentradi civilians back into military service. You're trying to make them so upset that they join your cause. And that's one of the cool little mechanics of this game is that when you pull, you actually pull civilians off the map and you put them into your hideout as units that you can now use to further your military cause. Like you have an action that will allow you to like convert some of the Robotech expeditionary forces and Trotty to your side, you can like bribe them over to your side. But the main way you get forces is by saying, hey, all you civilians in, you know, in New Portland City, come join me. And they're like, yeah, and they come join you and they jump into your army. And so like when you play as them, if you're able to get 11 civilians, pull 11 civilians off the board, you automatically win the game because you've now amassed a big enough army to just take over the region. And then that leads us with our fourth faction, though, our fourth but not last faction, which is the Anti-Unification League. And this is the Anti-Unification League are, are representative of those civilian populations that have been that have cropped up over the last two years. And so when you play as the AUL, your goal is to, you're a uh, freedom fighting unit. You know, you're like, you know, you're not quite rebels because you are still state, state, state sanctioned. It's this weird thing where like, again, the robot, the RDF has had such uh, a thumb over everything in the region that like there are civilian leaders. There's mayors, you have police forces and whatnot, but they're all they're not elected, they're selected by the RDF. And now with the discontent that's rising, the civilian leadership thinks that it's a that they can now use that to their advantage to actually become independent from 
the military. And of course, when you watch the show, there's some characters that are specifically pushing for an independence movement. And, um, and when you play as this faction, your goal is not to take over the whole board, but there are, spe- there are specific territories that are labeled as cities that you care about. So you're trying to get five cities on the board. But the cool thing about this faction is that it's really difficult to get five cities. So you have the ability to make more cities. One of the things that I love about this show is just how industrious they make humans out to be. Like the way that they put it is that for for the Zentradi are really bad at mechanics. They're only they're only bred to fight war. They're terrible mechanics. They don't know how to really work or build machinery. The humans, on the other hand, you see several times during the show where they just completely rebuild cities practically overnight. It's crazy. So whereas in the last two years, it's taken Chiron in his little hideout two years to like repair his building force. Whereas when you look at what the humans have been able to do, they've been able to sprout up like five or six cities, cities worth of infrastructure within the same amount of time. And um, that is that's that's the thing you're able to do as the AUL and like push forward and and you know build new new cities on the board and hold that territory to win the game. Yeah, there you go. A brief. <laughs> that's history, your fourth. A, a brief, brief history, history of, of really like, like, <laughs> No, it's, it's a brief, so cool. So like that's the thing, right? You got these you got these factions and you got this and that and like. I know that it's that some of this is a little bit of a hard, some of this is a little bit of a hard sell, right? Because it's, yes, it's anime. It's anime. And what's fun about the show is that you can see the trope, like the tropes that they use in that show are tropes that they're still using today. It's so funny that it's still, you're like, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's still contemporary. You know, that's some contemporary stuff, but the reason why I feel that, you know, the game really works is because, you know, they're there, even if you don't know the show, if you just get that brief, you know, you get that briefish overview, like, there's a lot there, but if you just know like, okay, military, military allies, rebels in, in, in incursion force, a, a, um, a terrorist organization force, essentially, like people are able to like grapple onto that and go forward because everything is themed that way. And yeah, I mean, I, I had never forward. heard of the show when I played and it, it was very easy for me to latch on to like the, the different perspectives of the, of the factions. Right. Cause the, you see it's, it's the same kind of story you see in many places, right? You have like the two militaristic forces and then you have a uh, civilian, groups that have different agendas and want different priorities and are operating in non-militaristic ways. Yeah. It, it makes, it makes perfect sense, but I love that there's like, especially for fans of the show, there's this, all this rich lore that leads them into the game. And I, and I'm sure, you know, for, for them, it, it's, it's even more uh, exciting. Uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the remarkable things about the game when I played it is that it was so simple to get, into the story of what was going on even if you know i didn't understand any of the references it still made sense from a like behavioral standpoint which is really cool yeah and that was one of the things when designing this game where between aaron and i we split up the task one of the ways that we split up the tasks was that through designing was that i was going to do a deep dive into the lore and make sure everything was lore consistent. And he was going to stay as far away from everything Robotech for as long as possible because he also he may have been aware of it, but he never watched, you know, he never watched or heard of really heard of the show before. So like we purposefully divided our, our streams like that so that so that he always came from it from a gameplay first aspect of like. Does this work as a game? Is this too much nonsense? Can this still make sense to somebody who's never heard of this before? And I was always kind of coming at it from the lore perspective of like, of like, well, yeah, I guess we can rework this or, or maybe no, this is a hard stop. We shouldn't do this because of like all of these 15 convoluted things <laughs> that wouldn't make sense. But maybe we could come up with a different solution here to still be able to get the end result that we want uh, without breaking 
you know, without breaking anything, you know, background wise. Because what's interesting about these nine episodes is that one of the reasons that this comes off potentially, because again, because it's anime, I know that there's, there's the possibility of having like a, a bad impression of it just because it's anime, right? It's like, oh yeah, you don't want to put up with that anime stuff. But like, this is, this is even a little bit more of a trick than you might, than, than you may even be used to because like these nine episodes show wise, like in the course of the actual episodes is really your addendum right? It's your epilogue to the, to the main story. And what the writers did at the time when they made these episodes was they used the setting as a way to kind of, to just, they use it as a way to resolve the storylines that was going on that was set up before this. And so what that means is that these nine episodes are primarily used to sort out the main love triangle of the story. Yeah. But here's the thing, they were good enough to have all of this other, like all of the stuff that I've just described is all right there, just running in the background. So what I, what, what we ended up doing with this game was taking all that background element. That's so, that's actually very rich and detailed and cogent and pushing that to the foreground. So in this game, like you can see the love triangle, but it's been, it's been pushed to the background Whereas all of the, the social movements and the, the standings and the, the desires of the, the bad guy, uh, the desires of the bad guys of the Zentradi rebellion and the, the wants and like cities going independent over the course of the, of the series, all of that's been pushed to the foreground. So even if you are familiar with these nine episodes, this recontextualizes all of that in a fairly different and unique light. What was the beginning of this game design? Were you just like, I want to make a game about this anime and you, and you kind of sought out the, the IP rights or, or how did they go? So the, the story here is that as a game designer, one of the things, one of the hardest things to do as a game designer is to get a, a smaller game designer is to get your games play tested. So in the region, I live in the Washington DC region and there's a group uh, that was created. There was like a Baltimore, a small group by, by a Baltimore designer who got his designer friends together once a month to play get, to play test games. You know, Aaron and I have been designing games since 2011, so we've been around a little bit. And you know, through our connections, we were able to start. I was able to, to you know, I was able to be invited and went to this went to these once a month gatherings, and over time, I ended up meeting the owners of strange machine games and, you know, probably knew them probably had been like knew them and had played games with them for at least like a year before they were like, you know, have you, they're like, they're, they're working on their Robotech RPG and they're like, Hey, so have you, have you ever seen Robotech before? Because you know, was there we're talking about, I'm like, no, I've never seen Robotech before. This was like back in 2017. I'm like, no, I've, I've never seen Robotech before. Cause like, I do, I like anime, but like my earliest animes were things like Voltron, very little bit, a little bit of, you know, Voltron, Sailor Moon, and, you know, then Dragon Ball, right? So like, like even further away from the Robotech era, from, from when Robotech came out. And he's like, oh no, this is Robot, you know, like talk a little bit about it. It's like, you should watch it. And it's like, oh, maybe. <laughs> and after a few months, I'm like, you know what? I like anime. I should at least just watch the show. I should see what it's all about. And I watch it and I'm like, this is really good. This still holds up. This is really fun. And of course, because it was recommended at a game design group by a game publisher, you know, by a publisher who owns the rights to, who has the rights in order to make board games underneath the IP. I'm also watching it, but I'm also watching it with the gamer brain on, you know, like, oh yeah, what could be turned into a game here? So after watching, after watching it, I go back to him I'm like, okay, I got two game ideas. And I start to describe the first one. And he's like, no, 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 no. We already got that. That's already done. Then that's, that's, um, that, that's called the attack on the SDF one where you play, it's a cooperative game where you are, you're going essentially episode by episode as the good guys running around trying to defend it. It's a little, it's a little Battlestar Galactica without the traitor mechanic. It's a little bit castle panic, with uh, with a little bit more uh, with a little bit that that's uh, it's a you know it's still crunchier than that because you mm -hmm. still gotta like launch out 
And so that's, that's the first one. And then I started to describe this and he goes, well, we don't have anything in the reconstruction era yet. And we know that, that there have been people who are interested in, so put together a prototype and let's, let's see what, what you do. So that's how, that's how the design started. Right. So I didn't start designing it until a, I knew somebody who had the license because it is really difficult in order to put together a game. If you don't have an in to the license for it. The last time I, I saw, I was at, um, I was at a, a, at an origins a number of years ago and some design a designer had put together a game for captain America civil war, oh, man. but he didn't, but he didn't know, but he, but he wasn't part of the design team. He wasn't part of, you know, like he, he had to pitch them. He had to, he knew who the rights holders were, but he had to pitch them the game. So like he came prepared with basically a fully decked out get, you know, with a fully decked out game, like an almost finished game in order to be able to say this will work. And meanwhile, the rest of us who are looking at this going, man, that's a great game, but it's never going to get picked up because <laughs> there's, there's so many layers you have to go through, which is a bit of a shame Yeah, because it was a good game and I don't, and I don't think it ever got, we had ever got published but I, I can imagine going through like disney marvel is a lot of bureaucracy there <laughs> or at least getting to the people who can put together i mean anyway won't won't get into that so yeah i had to know that so before even designing it i had to you know know the rights holder and you know that's not to discourage anyone out there if there's a favorite ip of yours go nuts don't make whatever you want just don't expect to sell it on kickstarter that's all yeah. just play it with your friends and have a great time do it. It's a, it's a worthwhile experience. So that was put together. Then the secondary question, which is usually asked is like, okay, so this, this is, a, this is the idea. And what is it really based off of? Right. And there's this series of games put together by uh, GMT games designed originally created by Volker Rundi who created a series of games called the coin series or the counterinsurgency series. And what I think, and, and the thing that, you know, people need to understand is of course, this game is not associated with GMT. It wasn't worked with on with anybody at GMT. They're, they're their own thing. But the thing is like, as I watch the show, because I'm a fan of coin games, I'm a fan of Adrian Avis and I'm a fan of Cuba Libre and, and, um, and the one that I own that I can't remember a fire in the lake yeah. off the top of my head. Right. And like, I'm a fan of these games. So as I'm watching Robotech, I'm like, wait a minute, these guys, these, these robot, this Robotech defense force, what they're doing or what they need to do is they need to do a counterinsurgency, which of course it's the eighties. So of course they don't really, I don't, they don't necessarily have the language, you know, these are, it's the eighties and it's, and it's animators who's creating the series. So they don't really have the language for this, but it's like, oh, the Robotech Defense Force needs to be fighting a counterinsurgency right now because the, the Zentradi Rebellion led by Chiron, they're committing small acts of terrorism. I mean, they commit terrorism on Christmas Eve for crying out loud. It's a great episode, but it's like, but it's like, okay, so you got your terrorists and you have your anti-terror movement because again, they are pulling, they're, they're getting their people, their troops straight from the civilian population. So, okay. So the RDF needs to be fighting a counterinsurgency. And the, and the thing about it is that, well, here's the little thing about Robotech reconstruction. If you go by the historical narrative the AUL wins the game. <laughs> it is actually the AUL that the AUL is the faction that ends up winning. So the RDF in the show does a terrible counterinsurgency <laughs> job. They, they do a terrible job at it. And no wonder, and it's no, you know, it's no wonder why they lose. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give away major, you know, I'm not going to give away spoilers for the end of it, but like they lose and the AUL wins. And and the Zentradi Rebellion loses <laughs> too. They lose. They so it's like so you watch it and you're like, okay, so this is a this is a game of counterinsurgency. So that that then becomes like okay, because what's cool is that when you can look at something and be like, okay, yeah, there's there's a basis like there is a, a vocabulary and a language here 
that can be used to convert it into a board game. Cause that's always like the hardest thing to do, right? Is to take, is to translate something that you see out there and then get it into a board game. But here you, since there, since the coin series is a thing that had existed, has, has existed and it's like, okay, well, I can see how this, this in the show is a counterinsurgency. So this, this game makes sense as a, coin game, but it has to still be Robotech, you know? So there's, there's a lot of, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that we've done to the coin, to, to, to the coin series where it's not, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a light coin game, right? This is a game that takes, that takes about two hours to play. And if people know what they're doing, it takes, you know, it, it can take even less time. The, one of the design goals was to make it be a 90 minute game kind of failed at that. It's a little longer, but you know, a two hour game, is, is, that's a that's a solid you know that's a, that's a solid game that you can play in an evening and the idea is that like in the show you have this weird you have this interesting thing where like the leaders of the different factions they're always talking to each other you know they're always talking to each other so like one of the things you wanted to do in this game was to make it so that you know you had a lot of heavy interaction between the players in the way in in what they do and like the, we've set up this system whereby there's every the heart of the game is a deck of cards there's a small deck of cards each with their own individual action that can drastically change how the game is played and one of the things that we do is that at the beginning of each player's turn before they play a card they have an option of trading a card with another player and what that does is heavily facilitate a whole lot of discussion amongst the group Right. The, and, and that, that really mimics, you know, <laughs> that does mimic the things in the show where it's like, Hey, so when was the last time that a rebel leader got on the phone with like the head of the government, like the presidential government and like started insulting him to their, to his face like that, that I, there's not many historical parallels to that, but I think that happens once or twice in the show. Right. It's great. The bad guy gets on and starts taunting people. And then the, our, our, you know, the head of the RDF, he like retorts right back at him. And it's like, this is great. We wanted to have that element in there. And the way that these, that this game plays out is that the game is only four rounds long. And in each round, each player only gets one turn. And at the end of each round, besides for the first round, the game could potentially end. And the way that, that that doesn't become unbalanced is that the players are able to control who goes last in a round so that you make sure that somebody who can't win doesn't get placed last. Or if somebody who is last, somebody, the player who is last gets played, like the player who goes second in a round determines who goes last. So it's possible to say, okay, we know who's going to go last. So now we just have to set the, ourselves up to make sure that they can't win by the time it gets to their turn. So even though you have a half ally and a full enemy and a half enemy, there are also points in this game where everybody's like, okay, how do we make sure they don't win? And what's funny about that is that Everybody comes to it from the perspective of, well, it's your job to make sure they don't win, not my job. I'm going to just do my own thing, but you have to stop them from winning. And then that person goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> he has to stop them from winning because I can't do that. <laughs> right. And like, that's where, that's, that's where you get this player to player interactability going on where you know you each got the hand of cards that can do special things and there's not that many cards so players if you play it a couple of times you'll know what all the cards are so you can be like searching and hunting for like oh i know the right card to play but who has it and what would they be willing to give up to make that happen the way i call it is that there's, there's this is a game where there's like 75 percent of the games on the table but 25 percent of the game is up up heads up with the rest of the players because if the only thing you do when you play this game is just focus on i'm just going to win for myself and i don't care about anything else you are going to lose so quickly <laughs> yeah because you're I like i just i experienced that firsthand <laughs> i was like I, well i'm not going to worry about the intricacies of uh of the dynamics i get i have a vague understanding i'm just going to try to push my win condition it did not work 
I did get into a winning position, but it was, you know, it was easily defeated. Uh, so I counted that as a minor victory. Yeah, if it, it feels a lot. I mean, you know, obviously, coin has the coin system has similar things going on, uh, but in terms of like how condensed it is and how how tight it is, it reminds me a little bit also of Inish. I don't know if you've played that game. I have not played Inish, but I do know what you're. Yeah, I so, do know what you're referring to. Because in Inish, yes. you like once you get into a win state, you have to like announce it to everyone, and then basically you like dare them to come <laughs> knock you out of that win state, <laughs> and uh, so it formalizes it. But it, it you know it, it felt similar to Robotech uh, in that you know once you get down to the wire, it is really about both trying to position yourself to where you can win, but also making sure no one else puts themselves in an unbeatable position, uh, which is really cool. So obviously the game's inspired by coin a lot, but there's, it certainly doesn't like, it doesn't borrow all of the coin mechanisms. It borrows the asymmetric, uh, nature of it, but the card play is, is different. And a few other elements are different. What went into the decision of where you deviate from kind of the coin standard mechanisms? So a lot of the design decisions had to do with the audiences that we're playing to the, the audiences that the people that we think are going to actually pick up this game. Right. Cause we know that we're, we're going towards people who like Robotech. Right. And we can't assume that people who play, who, who like Robotech really have any background in war gaming. I mean, it, it is, it is granted that like, most of Robotech, like the reconstruction area is a very weird time because you do have these multiple factions running around for the most of the, for the, for a big part of the rest of it, you, it's really huge, you know, up until that point, it's humans versus Centrati. So it's always like one-on-one. So you always have, so you have more like this one-on-one combat. So we have to walk into this, assuming that nobody in our audience who's going to play this thing has ever actually played a war game before, and especially not a coin game. Right. So we need to adapt the design to be as accessible as possible for people who have never touched this stuff before, who may be interested to it in the theme, but not the other, not the other way. And the other thing is that we have to design it around the idea of people who have no background in Robotech either, because one of the things that we've been seeing, you know, and and we kind of had a little bit of this idea beforehand, but especially when, as we've been like publicizing this game and getting different groups uh, to play it, what happens is you have one person in a group of four who say, I know Robotech, this is interesting to me, let's play it. And the other three people have no idea what Robotech is. Right. So it, so the game has to be accessible to both people who don't know, who haven't played war games or people who don't even know Robotech. And there's a lot of decisions that kind of, there's a lot of design decisions that kind of come out of that in order to take the uh, coin concept and make it as accessible as possible for people to play. So like one of the things that we do is we have a naming convention where um, every faction has a series of actions that they can take on their turn. And even though all of their actions are performed slightly differently or, and, or are operated in a little, a little differently than everybody else, they all have like the same base tag name to them. You move, you're, you know, you're moving, you're attacking, you're influencing, you're flipping, you're building, um, you're, you're, you're taking income. Right. You have these base names so that one of the key features in this game is that despite the seemingly low number of rounds and turns you potentially get in actuality, you're not just you don't you are going to be taking more turns because the game is encouraging you to play other players event cards. Because, again, you got these unique event cards that can do some really powerful things if played properly. And when you're playing the game, you're trying to set yourself up to use these cards and to have other people play your cards so that you get to take more actions. You get to do more things. And the game incentivizes you to do this because when you as a player play another player's event card, you are 
doubling the amount of actions that you get to take on your own turn. So you get to do, you get to take more actions and more powerful actions when you potentially give somebody else a powerful action when it is not their turn. So part of the game is figuring out what, what to give to other, what to give to other people. Now, this action economy is completely different from a coin game. In a coin game, you have an event deck and every turn you get to see the current event and then the upcoming event. And there's a priority order. And if you're high in the priority order, you can decide if you're going to take your turn now or wait till the next turn, if you're going to take the action on the card, or if you're going to do more actions on your board, you know, there's, there's, there's some there, you know, that, that really, again, in the coin game, the cards are still like the heart of the game because that decision-making process of when you're going and what you're doing when you're going and the timing of which is all very important. And here we've removed that element because we wanted to make the game shorter than a coin game because coin games can take, you know, can take two and a half, three to four hours to play depending on how you're doing it. And we know that because again, we're going to people who maybe haven't played war games, maybe certainly haven't played coin games. We wanted to make sure that no matter what happened, you're still kind of in this tight 90 minute to two hour game. And in order to do that, we standardized turn order in the sense that everybody gets a turn and there's only four rounds in the game. Now, to even help accelerate that, what we did was we also purposefully designed the game so that it's possible for every faction to win in round three. So at the end of round three, it's possible for somebody to win the game. And, you know, if you have some hubris and you think you can shoot for it, absolutely go ahead. But it's also very possible for somebody to break away and win it in round three. And it's even possible for you know somebody to win the game in round two if they're able to uh, get the better of everybody else at the table. But but like yeah, this this so the whole idea around it is this very tight design where the game goes four rounds, but like everything comes to a head in round three for practically everybody, and that just you know amps up the tension for the players as they're. They're like, oh no, but then, you know, there's so many times where you get into round three and you already have like two people in a winning, in a potential winning position and everyone's figuring out like, okay, well, we got to stop them, but then we also have to stop them. And I still need to try to get ahead while stopping these two. Okay, <laughs> let's do this, right? I just played a game with a group where it was the funniest thing in the world. I'm just watching them play it and they they're they're at they're at the end of round two and they're all arguing about who can actually win the game and everyone's like we can't you know there's one person who's ahead and everybody else the one there's one person that's ahead and the other three are like we can't stop them we can't stop them and i'm looking at it from a from a game master perspective because i can see all the cards because it's on tabletop simulator by the way this game is on tabletop simulator in fact i'm so bad at marketing <laughs> Robotech Reconstruction is available now for pre-order on the Strange Machine Games website. Um, <laughs> you can go there now and pre-order the game. We're doing it on a on a uh, pre on a pre-order system. We're not going to charge until we get so many. We're, no, we're not going to charge anything until we get so many orders in. But um, we're hoping to get everything out by quarter two of uh, quarter two of 2022. So when we hope to have the physical copies. But you can do that. You can also go to the Steam Workshop and you can get the mod for Tabletop Simulator to take a look at the game in its current state. It's very close to done. But, uh, you know, Aaron and I, we've been going back in like grammar, 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 changes in the rule books, just cleaning things up and making it easier for people, you know, to understand. But uh, so, so it's not the final version, but it, it's pretty darn close. So we're playing this game on tabletop simulator. And it's so funny because I'm looking at it and they're all complaining. There's no way we can stop this person from winning. And I'm looking at it going, actually, there are four different, very unique ways you can stop this player from winning. You're just trying to figure out amongst yourselves who's actually going to step up to the plate and do it. So, and that's all part of the action, you know, that's all part of the action economy and the card, card trading and the action economy, which is different from uh, coin. And then, um, one of the other unique things, you know, comes straight from the show, the whole thing with that civilian 
concept, right? Because in a in a coin game, you do have these civilian centers where you they have loyalty and they, the loyalty is either pro government or pro rebel. But here, because of the unique nature of the show, it's really like no, you have these civilians and either they're happy and they're content and that's good, or they turn around and join the enemy and they become part of the enemy's army. And that element where like civilians are literally leaving the board to join the fight, that's unique. And, and of course, all of this is just to try to make it again, as accessible as possible. I feel like we're fighting to be like the intro coin game uh, because, you know, just in the way that players go through their turns, the way th- the, the speed of which things move, it's like, if you had never played a good coin game before, and then you play this and then you're like, I want to try one of these historic, like, I want to play Gandhi now. I want to do this, but with Gandhi, it's like, now you have a good foothold into it and you, you will be able to better understand that game than, because you've played this one, right? Yeah, and I think <laughs> the, core, the core thing that, that the game helps you understand, because if you, if you did start with the Robotech and then moved on to the coin system, there would be a number of things you have to learn, like how the, how the events work, because the whole card play system is different, as you said. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the fundamental thing that translates that I think... It, which is to me the most compelling thing about both coin games and Robotech is the kind of right angles you have to think in in terms of of you're never able to really directly achieve your goals. You're always somewhat reliant on another player advancing the position that allows you to achieve your goals, right? There's always the thing like that's the hardest thing when I started with coin games is I got fire in the lake first. Cause that's the one everyone says is the best, which it's very good. I love it, it. Probably is the best, but it's not the one I would recommend starting with. <laughs> uh, and we're looking, yeah, I remember we, we, we learned the game, we taught it and we're looking at like the player sheets and I'm like, none of this seems to actually advance my win condition, but you have to get in this mindset of like, Oh, all of it m- could advance your win condition if certain things are met, but it's the other players that need to meet those other criteria. And so I think that translates pretty well, right? Like control and uh, military control and, and, and influence over the civilian population always rely on each other, even though you, you as a faction only ever care about one of those things, but they always go hand in hand. Uh, which yes. that's the part I think that really from from at least my one play that that's what really translates. It's that kind of altered way of thinking of I can't just go directly towards my my win condition like that's not possible to do. Yeah. And that is one of the that was one of the fun thing about about the game design. The design element of it is saying, OK, everything that you want to do, you're really bad at doing. <laughs> and it's a lot harder for you to achieve than your ally. And that's always the thing like, hey, you need to blow some stuff up. Well, your ally is really good at that. You're not. Or, hey, you need to like influence a bunch of people all over the place. Well, guess what? Your ally could influence people just like that with a snap. No problem. But for you, it's a bit of a challenge. And so like there's a, that, that was the that, that was a fun element of designing this where you're like how frustrating do we make it? Because <laughs> it's like <laughs> because it's asymmetrical factions and it's not like you know in, in in a game like Root where you also have asymmetrical factions. The way that Root works is that you have both the board puzzle but you also have your internal puzzle that is separate from everybody else, right? That that they can't really, they can meddle a little bit with your design, but they really have to know what you're really gunning for in order to do that. But with this game, what you're trying to do and how you do it is like out in the open for everybody. So everybody knows exactly what you're after and what you need to do to do it. So what that interestingly does is it forces you to pick a secondary goal 
for yourself. That's what you have to do as the player. Cause you're like, well, everybody knows I'm trying to do this. Now, how do I do that in a sneaky manner <laughs> so that they don't quite, so that they don't quite catch on? You know, this is not a game where you want to be in first place. This is a game where you want, this is one of those games where you want to be in second place until you're not, until you win. And that's always a trickier thing to do because you're kind of like hiding in plain sight and you're like moving a slightly longer term plan, even though admittedly, because this game is so short, there's only so many rounds, the game is fairly tactical. But if you're going to win, you kind of have to go a little bit beyond that tactics and actually you know, be able to pull some stuff off. Like we had a game where the AUL wins the game at the, at the end of round three and the entire time, what they do is for the first two rounds, they completely abandon the cities. Their whole goal is to take all the cities, but for the first two rounds, they just, they just leave the cities. And it's like, you know what? We don't even need it. So they made themselves so non, not a threat for the first two rounds of the game that the rest of the players just kind of forgot that they could just march back into the cities and just win the game, which is what they did <laughs> in round three. Cause they go from, cause like we have a little point tracker where you keep track of everyone's score. Cause like you said, as opposed to Inish where you have to announce that you are now, I am now winning the game. There's a little point tracker where you just kind of like keep track of how everybody's doing. So you can look over and be like, Oh, who's threatening or not. But, but here's the, but here's the trick that can be very misleading. Like in the AU, in that example, the AUL had zero points, but in one round, they went from zero to five and won the game. Uh, so really what you have to do is you have to look at their points, but then you also have to look at what's called protoculture in this world. So there's this resource in Robotech that's called protoculture. It's fairly undefined in the show, but it's essentially the, th the thing you use to get stuff done. Right. It is a material. It's an energy. It's a, it's a resource that you use to get stuff done. And in this game, the way I always say it is like, if you look at the, the protoculture, compare where the faction's current protoculture is, or I'll just say income from here on out. Cause again, you, you spend it kind of like cash to get stuff done. You look at their current protoculture versus where they started, where they start the game. And that actually will give you a better gauge of how well they're doing or not more so than their point total. Because if they have a lot of protoculture and they have a lot of resources comparatively to where they started, they can basically do anything they want on their turn and they can come back in an instant and win the game. Which uh, which I was almost able to kind of pull off. I don't know. I I got. I saw an opportunity again in the one game I played. I, I found an opportunity to just generate massive amounts of money. I'm like, well, that can't be a bad thing, right? And then, <laughs> like the first two rounds, I just stockpiled money, and then I think in round three, it, I tried to make a bold move, but it was it was not uh, sustainable. Which uh, which faction? I can't remember which faction you I played the, as. Uh, the uh, the freedom. Was that you the, were the yeah. You were the, the AUL. AUL. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then round three, yeah. I I I dropped like a whole bunch of people in like a centralized location, and then moved them all out to a bunch of cities, and <laughs> uh, but spread myself a little too thin. I couldn't hold it all, but I did have lots of money, which felt nice. And then I, I spent it all at once. I'm curious what what was the biggest challenge in this design process for you? Was it charting the game to the the story of the anime was it like shortening the, the play time i know you've mentioned that a couple of times were there, were there any particular challenges well the good news is that for those those two things specifically is that they weren't well you know how uh limitations breed the, the phrase limitations breed creativity mm -hmm. oh yeah so like these the the two things you just mentioned the anime sticking to the anime and having a short play time those were actually the parameters that the rest of it was kind of built in. Like, no matter what happens, we got to stick to the anime. So you got to have these, you know, you like, you know, you got to have these characters. It would be criminal if Minne was not in there, you know, it, like, and not as a, as a character. Um, I was able to re sneak Roy Folker in there as well for people who know. Um, and it's like, 
Uh, so that's the enemy is a parameter, but then also trying to do everything possible to keep it within. Again, at the very beginning, it was a 90 minute trying to be, okay, what do what does it take to be 90 minutes? And those were the limitations that was placed on that, that we placed on ourselves as we were building the game. And so that helped breed creativity as to how to actually get this stuff done, right? You say, okay, we got 90 minutes. So that means we're going to expect X amount of turns to be overall in the game. So now knowing that you're all, that this game is only going to be this many turns long, how do we make, how do we make it compelling? And really the hardest thing to design in it was the, was the balancing. The, that balancing this out took the longest because it's not because it's asymmetrical. The balance cannot be symmetrical. It can't necessarily be completely fair, but it can't be unfair either. <laughs> like the, the, the thing that I, that I like to say is that, so there's this, there's this thing that happened where at first it was like, okay, here's all of our event cards. We're going to take all the event cards and we're going to shuffle them up. And that's going to be, that's going to be that you're going to get your hand and you're going to be able to like do stuff. But the problem is what we, what we quickly learned is that, yeah, there are much more powerful event cards and there are very useful, but not game winning event cards. And the, and the thing that we tried to solve for the longest time is how do we make sure the game doesn't end in the first round? Cause that doesn't feel fun. That would never feel fun if the game just ends in the first round that doesn't feel accomplished. That just feels like something's broken. And because of the design decisions we were making, my goal was to just like make it so that it was impossible for somebody to win in the first round without having a rule that said no one can win in the first round. Now, if you look at the rule book, you'll see that eventually a rule was put into place that said nobody can win in the first round. However, we did several steps of design to make sure that that didn't happen. We tinkered with starting positions and locations of all the factions to make sure that nobody was in a spot in order to, you know, nobody had the resources potentially to win in the first round. Uh, we fixed the card balance where we now have, and this is, then this is still really fun where you have like those useful and situational cards will always get dealt out at the very beginning of the game. So the more times you play, you're going to see kind of the same series of cards, but then there's the second, then there's the more powerful card deck that gets dealt out one at a time. So as the game goes on, the power of the cards ramps up over time, which is, you know, one of those things where it's like, well, duh, that's how you should do it. But like, it wasn't there at the beginning and now it is, and it, the game's better for it. Um, there's right. So the, the cards that you use get more powerful over time. And then there was a lot of tweaking about how big players forces were. Cause we do have a unit cap. So once, you know, each faction can only grow so big on the table in size. So you had to worry about that. You had to worry about, you know, making sure that that wasn't, po you know, that victory was not possible. And then only after we did all of those steps and tweaked it to the point where we felt that we didn't need to have that, you know, nobody can win in the first round. We still then put in place the rule that, no, that nobody can win in the first round because we realized that like, if it is possible it will happen even though it is extraordinarily rare to happen and so we, we we put in the rule but before we got to that point we did everything possible to make sure and and like it doesn't happen and it like it doesn't happen even though even though once you say nobody can win in the first round that actually opens players up to do more crazy things in the first round because well, they can't lose, so why not do anything? Which is good. That allows for greater player experimentation in turn one. But it also, but what what's also interesting is that even when you say nobody can win in round one, it's also still extraordinarily rare for anyone to actually be in a winning position at the end of round one, just because we've designed we we put it all together in a way that you just, again, how frustrating do you want to make it? So like, you just can't get there in, you know, you just can't get there in round one.
somebody could threaten but they're also then putting themselves, you know, they're, they're putting, you know, they're, they're, they're sticking their neck out at that point. And like, do you, again, this is not a game where you want to, you know, you don't want to be going into round two with your neck already out because it's going to get cut. Mm-hmm. So that that's really where the major tweaking was going on. It was really just in that balancing of the four factions to make sure that everybody still had that round three, put that nobody could win in round one, but everybody can win in round three. Just making sure that that, that, that push and pull could happen there. Yeah. And, and the, and the game due to just its nature, everyone can affect everyone else. It does allow for a lot of like what you might call player, so player self balancing, I suppose. Uh, within but yeah making the game so that like the the flow of it feels correct is is, yeah i i haven't thought of that before as like an element of balancing the game of making sure like the narrative flow works so you don't you know have round one round games and such uh is interesting and there is definitely that thing about player correctedness where because you are incentivized to play other players' event cards, if there's a if there's a situation where one player gets so far behind in the first round of the game, what I've seen is that players will just start playing that player's event cards more often because they're like, well, this person's losing. They can't possibly win. I'm going, I can play their event cards without fear of them being able to do anything. But then when everybody does that, that gets them right back into the game. And now, yeah, yeah. you know, by the end of the next round, then because they got so many gimmies by the other players, they're like, ah, I'm back now. Mm-hmm. And so you have these, you have these bouncing back and forth where if you get hit too hard, you come back right away. Um, I always feel bad for the AUL player, you know, the one that you <laughs> played. I always feel bad, a little bad for them because it's so easy in the first two rounds to just hammer on them. And yet, kind of do have to hammer on them but you don't have you like you don't have to but it is the, like the, the early cards make it maybe oh it makes it a little bit easy to hammer on the AUL but that's also because if you don't kind of do that they can they they really can run away with it <laughs> yeah yeah because once because with the city building ability right like yeah. once they get enough you know a couple extra cities out there you can't it's like whack them all, and there's too many moles now. <laughs> right, because once the AUL builds a city, you can't destroy those cities. They're 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 permanently on the board, and now you have this point center that they can just come back to again and again. And you mm-hmm. just have to worry about. You know, it's one of those things where when you play as the AUL, because you're civ- you're technically civilians, so the government can't attack you because that would be attacking civilians. They attack the rebellion. So that means as the AUL player, you feel like you're the safest player on the board. No one's going to touch you. No one's going to attack you until the Zentradi attacks you because you've built up too much, too big of a force. And now they're worried about you. Uh, Now they're like, ah, the Zentradi rebellion kind of has to kill a bunch of your units just so that they can then get out of the way and maybe have your opponents come in and take that three point city away from you that you've built up yeah. strange bedfellows, you know, strange Indeed. bedfellows. <laughs> uh, I wanted to touch a, a little bit on the card trading, like the trading element, because mm-hmm. it does seem to be a very important part of the design, but it's, it's rare. You see a game like this that just has a, like trading phase frequently throughout the, like on every player's turn, you can trade cards and negotiate. And I think the fear often is from a designer's perspective is that it, it'll drag the game down. Uh, but at least in my play, it didn't seem to much, it, it didn't add much play time. Um, and I think, you know, th- as I was thinking about the design, it definitely seems necessary to, you know, bring about that, added element of interaction and I think probably makes the game far more interesting for an experienced group of players who know all the cards and that is that your experience that that's where that gameplay element really shines that's right the um and and what's funny about it is that when it was like in the very first prototype you couldn't trade cards right it was just it, it was just you get a hand of cards and you got to play what you got Right. It's a little twilight struggle in that way of just like, okay, this is the hand I got. Let's see what I can do with it. 
but it became really apparent very quickly that that just wasn't going to fly because, you know, and, and uh, this change really, you know, was really pushed by Aaron on this one because like of all of the benefits you get from having a card trade, which I'll go into just a moment, but like from a gameplay element, what happened was you get to, cause again, you get to the end of the round and if whichever player is going last in a round is a very powerful thing. And it really matters because again, the players get to decide who that player is going to be, right? They can decide on that by the cards that they play. Each card has what we call a reaction column that tells you who's going to go next. So that means that the player who goes first in a round gets to decide who gets to go second in the round. And the player who goes second in the round gets to pick the order of fourth, third, and fourth through the cards that they play. So they can't just say, you know, you two are going to go next, but you still have to like play a card that sets it up. So, and that, that, you know, sometimes that becomes like a decision in your hand of like, well, I really want that player to go last, but then that means I got to play this card out of my hand and that might not be exactly what I want. So I have to like maneuver it another way. But anyway, so what would happen is you get to the end of a round, a player would be in the lead and the player who's going last looks at their hand and goes, well, I can't win and I can't stop them. So the game is just over. And that's a real feel bad moment right there. Meanwhile, you have the person sitting across from him going, I have the card that could have saved the day, but I can't do anything because when it was my turn, I didn't know that this was going to be a problem. And so the solution is having that card trade. Now, the Aaron's push for it was because, you know, we like because he likes information games. And really what happens once you start talking about card trade is you're talking about an information game because like what cards, because what, what's cool about the asymmetrical factions with this smaller card deck is that depending on who holds the card depends on the vitality and use of the card, right? A, a, a single card has like three different functions in it, just depending on whose hand it is, it is in. Either it's a card that A, will always get played, B, a card that will never get played, or C, a card that can be traded for as part of a bargain or a deal. And so when, when once you kind of know the cards, there are certain cards that you're looking for. If you don't have it in your hand, you want to find out who has it because either it could really help you or it could really hurt you. And so... Now, once you get into that card trade part, you're also getting into the information game of like, well, I have this and I can do this, or I'm looking for this, suggesting you don't have it, who does have it, (laughs) and what can I do to get it out of your hands, right? Or you get to say, ah, does any, who, hey, you, I know you want to play this. I know you want to play this. So let's set something up where I can give it to you. That's worth my while. And once you have that type of bartering going on at the top level, it makes, you know, even though your victory, again, your victory conditions do not change. Everybody knows what you want and what you're after. But by having that top level thing come up and by having these cards, which depending on who's holding them means different things, now you have a different game state every single time just by allowing players to reveal or hide or try to manipulate information. Because again, you get the card in your hand, you can keep these as private as you want. You can just say, I have a good card for you without just saying what it is. You could be lying to them. It's fine. <laughs> the game doesn't care. The game, the game just said, like what we say in the rules is that we encourage table talk, but, you, but no private talk. So you can't run off to a corner and have private conversations. Anything said needs to be said at the table. And the other thing we say is that any any plans or deals that are struck between players needs to be, uh, is non-binding. And we say that not because we know that this is a game of backstabbery. It's, it's, It's not. It's not a game of backstabbery. We say this because it's a game because it's a highly tactical game. And sometimes a plan that you come up with at the beginning of the round, you say, I will trade this card with you on my turn. I will play the card you give me and I will, and on your turn, you play the card that I gave you. But my turn is at the beginning of the round and your turn is at the end of the round. And by the time we get to the end of the round, that card may not make sense anymore. So the game doesn't hold you to being forced to play that now bad card. It has happened so many times where 
you do it, you make a deal. And by the time you get around to fulfilling the other half of the deal, you're like, wait, 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 don't, don't do that anymore. Let's just wait. Let's hold off. It doesn't make sense anymore mm -hmm. because of, because of everything that's happened in between, you know, there's four rounds, but there's a lot of stuff that happens within each round. And yeah, yeah. Having that, having that card trade has gone from not being part of the design at all to be being a very important part of the design is what makes it really fun when you have four people who sit down and know each other trying to play this game because they're all kind of you're all because like you're trying to get ahead so you're all kind of subtly trying to manipulate each other with good plays and good trades when really you're trying to benefit yourself <laughs> you're trying to benefit yourself more so than you're trying to benefit them and it's always a challenge one well while play testing, because as the designer, whatever I say, my what I say has a different weight than what your friend says to you while playing the game, right? If I suggest something, maybe I'm being on the level for all parties, even though really what I would want to be is skewed more towards my <laughs> towards my interests and not yours. That's that's just fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you've got this game up on pre-order right now. You've been play testing, it seems a lot on, on Tabletop Simulator and such for a while. How has the response been in terms, I don't know what you what your expectations were going in with this game, but now that it's getting close to being produced uh, physically, how has that process been, I, I guess, is, is my question. It, it, it's been an extremely encouraging um, the people that we have gotten it in front of people who have been doing, you know, independent feedback or reviews that we, you know, we've gotten a, a bunch of people to like play it on their own and then, you know, do podcasts or uh, live playthroughs and whatnot. It's been, it's been really gratifying to see that like the stuff that we wanted out of this game has been happening, right? You have stories where people are like, oh, and I played this faction and they felt like this. And we're like, yes, that's exactly how that faction should feel. And you are, you, you know, the, that's playing the way that we want it to. So like, I, I feel like reaction has been, you know, reaction has been good. And, you know, we're just really happy about that. And we've, you know, I've seen one or two suggestions about how, what format this game should take next, but it's like, you know, one, one game at a time, <laughs> one at a time. I know, I know you want to do invid people. I know you want the invid, but we going, going through one first, <laughs> we go through this first and then we'll, we'll see what we could do later. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to talk about with the game that, that we haven't covered yet? Well, did I mention that it is uh, currently up for pre-sales on Strange Machine Games? Uh, you did, but go ahead and mention it again. <laughs> I just, I mean, um, <laughs> right. Uh, the game is currently up for pre-sale right now at strangemachinegames.com. It's a it's a pre-order system, so we're we're looking to hit. I think it's like what P two hundred. We're looking to get a threshold of games before anybody gets charged. Um, but we're looking at having this out by uh, quarter two of 2022. Like you can't see it because it's a podcast, but it looks beautiful. We have our, our contacts over at Strange Machine Games. They've been working with this with the same artist for a couple of years now. And the problem is that he's so good. He's getting bought up by bigger, com you know, he's being commissioned by bigger companies to work on their stuff. It, you know, it, the, the board looks gorgeous. The, the pieces are great. You know, it's, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Like, yes, unfortunately the, all of the cards are screen caps from the show, but you know, I picked those out myself going through trying to make sure to be on just the right frame to get like, cause there's, you know, it, again, the show still holds up. It still looks really good. So even though that's not redesigned, it all still looks very good. Cause they had a lot of really fun keyframes. Uh, they had a lot of really fun keyframes in that show. And it's a thing where like, you know, interested in the coin system, want to try something lighter, pick it up. You know, the theme could potentially throw you off, but it's a lot more, you know, it's, it's not goofy. It's not goofy anime. It's, it is serious. Like, like we treat it seriously. We treat it like a historical war game. So while you still have, fun and kind of wacky characters running around you're still you know you are it's still crunchy you will be you will have to tactically think through how you're going to do 
what you're going to do. Um, and it's, it is meant to be played with four people. Like it's a three to four player game. If you play it with three, we have a bot that we have a very easy bot to play when you're for the Robotech expeditionary force, but the game really is meant, meant to be played with four people because of that information game that above the table play those conversations that you have and just people bouncing off of people in order to get what they want done. Yeah. So it's, and and so it's, a, it's a good time. And again, plays in two hours. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll get it done. And, and I'll echo all of that. I mean, like I said, I've only played it the one time, but man, what a, what a good first impression. One of the better first impressions I've, I've had of a game in, in a while. And I think I, I talked about this a couple episodes ago, but like, it really does capture that interfactional dynamic thing that the best coin games do. Like, you know, even though I don't really have that much interest in the show, uh, I don't dislike anime. I just not really into anime, but the game communicates this, this setting and it communicates the relationships between all these factions really clearly. And it's, it's, it's compelling. Uh, even if you don't have the the background knowledge of the show, uh, I found it really, really fascinating. I, I, I recommend definitely looking uh, into it, especially if you're a fan of the coin games or, or Root or, you know, the games now that are have grown from that system. Uh, this neatly fits into that. And I hope more eyes will get on it because, you know, I don't see a lot of chatter about it. And it's strange to me because it's, you know, sometimes games just like slip under a bit like and uh so hopefully this podcast will boost it a bit I, that's my <laughs> hope like you know sometimes uh you know i talk about a game on a podcast because it's just what i've been playing and i want to talk about it but like this one i really want more people to play this game <laughs> like it's just sitting there and, and no, i don't see people talking about it and they should uh, so go out there and seek it out. Find it on Tabletop Simulator and look into it. I, I think it's a really cool design. We have a number of review. We have a couple of reviewers lined up, but we need to, the, the, the thing is we need to give them the a physical prototype. I mean, we need to give them a finished product <laughs> for before they will, before they will review it. So what we are, exp what we're trying to so like, Part of this plan is to just say, hey, we're trying to get the word out to people who would really enjoy this thing, get this thing printed, and it will like we think that it will only continue to grow mm -hmm. in in popularity once it actually, you know, becomes not a pre-order, but a physical thing you could pick up and buy. When this gets in the hands of more people, we think it will. You know, it, its word will continue to spread. Um, it's really funny right now. If you go to the Board Game Geek, if you go to Board Game Geek and you go to the forum page, we've been answering a whole lot of FAQs, and it's so rare to see the designer put up an FAQ for themselves. That's not like not. It's not like we do it in the form of like a normal post of like, "Hey, what happens with this?" Except it's the designer posing the question and the designer po posing putting the answer. <laughs> So we're like, we're like preceding the rules part of the, F of the board game geek FAQ, just in case you have any questions <laughs> when you look that's, through this. That's a good idea. Yeah. Cause you always take a gamble when you're looking through the, uh, the forums to see if your rule question has been asked already. All right. Uh, what's the website once again for the pre-order? Strangemachinegames.com slash Robotech dash reconstruction. So if you just go to strangemachinegames.com, they have a tab up top that's just their Robotech line of games because this is this is not the only Robotech game that they've made, but they have a they have a, a couple of them in series. Um, and of course, this is every single one of these games are different than ours. So you know, we're each each game in the product line is different. But um, strangemachinegames.com, you can go there, go to Robotech Reconstruction, and you can pre-order. And uh, I know you all are on Twitter. Uh, what's the what's the Twitter handle if people want to follow you there? 
That's right. So um, what's nice about having a strange name like Dr. Wits is that if you just Google Dr. Wits, all of our stuff will come up. We have a website at dr.wits.com. We're on Facebook at Dr. Wits Board Games. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Wits. That's at D-R-W-I-C-T-Z. There you go. And yeah, just put in Google W-I-C-T-Z and we're going to come up. We got SAO all over this. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Everyone's dream. Uh, get, get the nice SEO metrics. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. If you would like to see what I'm up to, that's all at thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Uh, and uh, if you want to help out by rating and reviewing us on wherever you get uh, your podcasts from, that's also super helpful. And I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.